How strong is your faith in a godless world? Well, this struck a note with me, fortunately, because um, for a reason I'll mention in it very shortly, I'd been thinking about faith an awful lot. But my first reaction was, what a long title. Uh, and I suppose I reacted like that because I do the notices for our notice board of the uh, talks, the Bible Hour talks. And uh, I do it on an A4 sheet on the computer and laminate it. And I thought, there's no way I could get all that with letters big enough for anyone to be able to read them, passing the hall. Um, and I was discussing this with a brother, a young brother who has a sense of humour. Um, but um, he said, well, just call it Faith in the Real World. I suppose, actually, that's quite a good title um, because that's what we're faced with, isn't it? Although we like to be not of the world, the reality is we live in the world. We have to. Um, this is where we have been placed by God and we are in the real world one way or another, possibly more so if we're still in the occupation or working uh, than those of us who are retired. <clears throat> now, again, with the title, How Strong Is Your Faith? Um, I like to approach this from the point of view of how strong is my faith? And I invite you to do the same. Um, I'm not here to ask you a question about your faith, but perhaps you can ask, ask yourselves a few questions <clears throat> and perhaps I can introduce some thoughts that will help you to do that. <clears throat> you have to excuse me, but I've suddenly got a, a frog in my throat. I think I was talking too much over that delightful lunch we had. Thank you very much. Um, the reason I've been thinking a lot about faith was about probably about 12 months ago now, time flies. <clears throat> a brother who belongs to Kenilworth Ecclesia and has spent many, many years of his life caring in Christelphian care homes and indeed in other care homes as part of his career. And he said to me, you'd be surprised how many people lose their faith when they're facing imminent death. I thought, how strange. That's a moment when you need your faith most of all, I should think. And I said, well, why do you think that happens? And he, he was reluctant to say, you know, presumably he encountered this on a number of occasions with different individuals. <coughs> Many people, including brothers and sisters, lose their faith when they're facing imminent death. They realise that they're life is to come to an end very shortly. Uh, I mused about this for a while and I wondered why this should be the case. It could be of course that they are suffering significantly at that moment and that they believed that in fact because of their faith God would not subject them to this sort of suffering something which is worth thinking about and uh, I'll develop a little more shortly. Someone suggested that perhaps it was because they were afraid of the judgment. Well, that doesn't suggest a loss of faith to me. That suggests uh, possibly um, a mistaken belief. Um, they obviously still have faith that there is a God if they fear the judgment. So I don't, I don't think that, I didn't think that would be a reason. But um, the other thing that crossed my mind, having been um, essentially born a Christadelphian, um, we expected the return of Jesus in our lifetime when I was a youngster. And it hasn't happened, has it? And indeed, on many occasions, many uh, people, unwisely I suggest, predicted that Jesus would return on a specific date or time or uh, during a particular period when certain things happen. And this, despite the very clear words of Jesus himself, 
when he said that no man knows the time, I don't know the time. That was in his mortal life, he did not know the time. But nevertheless, we've, uh, some of us have uh, spent a lot of time and energy trying to predict when Jesus will return. And it could be that they've got to the end of their lives and they expected Jesus to return in their lifetime. They expected not to have to face death. I remember as an eight-year-old, I think I was, in 1948, seven or eight year, eight or nine-year-old, um, the excitement when the State of Israel was formed. I, just to explain, I lived in what I call a Christendom community because my dad had eight brothers and sisters and they all lived in the same neighbourhood and they were all Christadelphians. So I lived in a Christadelphian village. And <laughs> they had, there was a lot of excitement at that time and I, I felt it. As a child, I felt the excitement. Jesus will be back very, very soon. But that was in 1948. Well, he isn't back now yet, although I believe the Jehovah's Witnesses believe he is. That's another matter altogether. <coughs> Jesus has not returned, and perhaps that was a reason for them losing faith. There are a lot of threats to our faith in the modern world, <coughs> and we'll think about some of them very shortly. It's difficult to define faith. What's the difference between faith and belief? I have my own ideas, but I'm not going to dwell on them at the moment. Perhaps if we uh, do engage in discussion, people might like to uh, comment on that. Uh, it, faith is, of course, it's essential that you have belief, or you can't have faith. The two are inseparable in that sense. The faith is it can't exist without belief. But um, there is, I suggest, a difference. I, I didn't find um, the authorised version of definition in Hebrews, the first chapter of Hebrews of faith, uh, particularly helpful really. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Well that's not the sort of language that I use these days and um, didn't find that terribly helpful. Um, in the NIV, for instance, it says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Uh, and that, I think, is saying essentially what the NIV, uh, the authorised version says. The New King, King James Version says the same. Um, essentially saying it in modern language which meant a little bit more to me. <clears throat> so, let's think about what our faith is. Our faith is based on beliefs, for instance, or at least for a start, and essentially, that there is a God. And the God that we believe in is the creator and sustainer of all life and is in control. That's the first step, really. We can't prove that, can we? We try. But we can't prove there is a God. So that is where faith comes in to endorse and believe <coughs> that there is a God, a creator and sustainer. And of course, when we talk here, and when I talk of God, I'm thinking of God the Father, the God revealed in the Bible, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, we also believe, as part of our faith, that Jesus indeed existed, that he lived approximately 2,000 years ago, that he taught the new uh, gospel, the good news, that he healed sick, and that he was indeed both the Son of Man and the Son of God. And that, of course, is absolutely essential to our faith, that we believe that as Christadelphians, and indeed it should be the foundation of the faith of anyone who calls themselves a Christian. Jesus, the Christ, it should be really, although we tend to use the word Christ as if it were a surname, but it's Jesus, the Christ. And we commented this morning from John chapter 14, verse 6, and seven, that 
Jesus said, I am the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. He is the truth, the way, the correct route to walk, fight to God, and that he brings life. And that is essential part of our faith. Now, all the, both these things I've mentioned so far um, would be meaningless if we did not believe that the Bible is God's message to man. Because all our beliefs which lead to our faith are based on our understanding of the Bible. The Bible is God's message to man. In actual fact, we can't prove any of the things that I've said now completely and emphatically. So we have to have faith that it's true, that the Bible is God's message to man. We appear not to have any other form of message at the present time, uh, as was experienced with the Apostles, with the Holy Spirit, able to uh, confirm the beliefs that uh, we now follow and have faith in. <clears throat> and of course, our faith requires a response. It's no good saying, I believe, we just read James chapter 2, um, if it has no effect on the way we live and the things that we do. And we believe that our essential early response is baptism, based on the things that we believe, which means that that baptism has to be when we are old enough to understand what it is that we believe and have faith in. And that's why we believe in adult baptism. And indeed, in doing so, we follow the example that Jesus set. He himself was baptised, admitted by John the Baptist. And we are therefore committing ourselves in baptism to following the example set by Jesus. Essentially, Jesus taught many things, but he summed it all up in a couple of verses, and in fact, it's referred to in that reading from James, although he only refers to there the neighbour, and the essential thing that we have to do to follow the example of Jesus and to put our faith into action is to love God. So we have to believe that God is there and exists. We have to have that faith. We are to love God with all our hearts, all our minds and all our souls. And we are to love our neighbour as ourselves. And James, in that reading, we just have referred to it as the royal law, to love your neighbour. <clears throat> Something else that our faith um, encourages us to believe, or our belief encourages us to have faith, perhaps it's that way around, I don't know. And this is a difficult one, I think, for many people, that God will forgive us. And that through the sacrifice of the life of Jesus, our sins can be washed away, forgotten, if we have faith. It is conditional upon faith. And that's, in some ways, I think for individuals it's quite difficult to believe that, because Perhaps we don't think ourselves worthy of such an incredible sacrifice being made on our behalf. <clears throat> and we can have faith that, as I've mentioned, that God is in control of things, in control of our lives. But there are times when things go horribly wrong in our lives. Horribly wrong. And the faith that we are will be protected and preserved and looked after can lead to us lead, losing our faith when we're faced with situations that are inexplicable, really. I was only a week or so ago told of a brother who has been looking after his uh, but seriously ill sister wife, elderly couple has had a stroke and is himself in hospital. And he's unable to look after his wife. So we have to be careful 
about those sort of things and how we understand that. But we only have to look, of course, at the examples in the New Testament, the examples of the apostles themselves. Uh, they suffered. They suffered as ordinary men do. Shipwreck, Paul, imprisonment, persecution, um, and very unpleasant uh, things within their lives that made their lives very difficult, but they held their faith, those in particular. Now, we don't face persecution now. Uh, nobody's threatened to kill me because I'm a Christadelphian. Yet they did, of course. They threatened to kill the apostles, and they did, did kill them. But they killed the uh, members of the early church because of their faith. It's very different now, and this is really, I suppose, getting to the real subject <laughs> of uh, faith in a godless world. I'm not quite sure how we define a godless world, except to say, just look around you. <clears throat> um, the problems that we face are very different to those that the first century apostles and disciples followed. We don't face persecution. What we do come up against enormously is apathy, total disinterest. But I'm talking, of course, now of uh, us here and now in Stafford or in the United Kingdom or in the Western world. There is so little interest, certainly within the UK, in such matters of faith that uh, we face apathy. And perhaps that can lead to us becoming apathetic. We give up. We can't spread the gospel. People won't listen. Uh, another threat now, again, very different to the disciples, is the comfortable life that we most of us have. And I think uh, that's probably a bigger threat than most. Um, it's so easy to be content and satisfied with things as they are. Why would we look forward to a, a kingdom when things are so good here? There's also an incredible access to entertainment, called, so-called. Um, when I was a youngster, I was forbidden from going to the pictures, um, being a the Christadelphian family. Um, I was allowed to go when I was 14. Uh, they, uh, but now they're in our room, front rooms, aren't they, for the most part. They're on television. Uh, there's, uh, I don't know, hundreds of channels now of different <coughs> television programmes. And uh, so there's so much distraction. So it's apathy and distraction, probably, and comfortable living are threats to our faith. And one that I encountered fairly recently is the preaching of atheism. Now, I don't think I heard this uh, being preached as a way of, of a, a, as a way of life years ago. But I, um, I went to a lecture, and the, the title of the lecture was also a question, Are All Faiths Bogus? And of course the uh, person giving the lecture had already got an answer. Of course they were. <laughs> and sadly, those people who have throughout the ages been religious, and indeed including those who have called themselves Christian, have given the atheists so much ammunition the horrors and the dreadful things that have been done in the name of religion and in the name of Jesus Christ. Wars fought, people slaughtered just because they didn't agree with those calling themselves Christian. Um, and of course this gentleman used a catalogue of events starting with the Crusades right through to, uh, well, present days to a degree on how that um, people calling themselves Christian had damaged Christianity as taught by Jesus. <clears throat> There's no question that there is a great deal of harm committed in the name of religion and Christianity. <clears throat> At the end of this lecture, there was time for a brief comment. And I said, well, if people had lived the life that Jesus Christ taught, none of these atrocities would have occurred. And he just condescendingly said, well, yes, I have to admit that Jesus didn't spread, spill any blood. And I wasn't quick enough, because I wanted to say, oh, yes, he did. Yeah. His own. 
and that's a very significant difference, but I'm afraid I only thought about that too late. Um, <laughs> now, um, there are different kinds of faith, really. There's what I would perhaps unkindly call a blind faith. <clears throat> um, and in contrast with that, what I would call my own faith, which is a reasoned faith. Um, base, beliefs based on probability and extreme likelihood that they are right. <clears throat> um, I suppose to some extent it's a matter of being pragmatic. We can see the wonders of nature, um, the miracle really of life on earth, and all the evidence around us that a brother, a friend of mine who was a biologist, but nevertheless, his faith is so strong because of the incredible things that he has he's taught about and learnt about during his lifetime. Just as a slight aside, I have a cousin. He actually lived in Stafford, um, and he taught at Stafford University. He, um, when he was a teenager, he decided he wanted to be a scientist. Philip, his name was, and uh, he, although brought up in a Christadelphian family of Christadelphian beliefs, he decided that there was no God, and he lived his life as an atheist, a committed atheist. He, to be fair to him, he didn't preach atheism, but he, he was convinced there was no God. And it was ironic, really, because I went to his funeral about three years ago, which was in the United Reformed Church here in, in Stafford. <laughs> and <laughs> there, there, there's a reason for that. Because it, I have to be fair and say it was a very good service conducted by a lady minister. And uh, afterwards, I went and spoke to her, and I said, you do know that Philip was a lifelong atheist, don't you? And she was sharp, quite sharp with me. I think she misunderstood. She thought I was criticising, which I wasn't. And she said, uh, yes, but that's not important in this context because funerals are for the living, not the dead. And his wife and three children are members of this church congregation. And there you are, shut me down. But nevertheless, <laughs> uh, I suppose that's a bit of an aside, really. But I chose the reading in James specifically because it's quite um, emphatic that faith in itself is of no value. We can say we believe all sorts of things, we can say we have faith in this, that or that, but unless <coughs> our actions demonstrate that our faith is real, then James is saying you're wasting your time and in fact you haven't really got any faith. <coughs> What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? There's a question there you might like to answer. If a brother or sister is naked or destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. And their works are indeed the evidence of our faith or lack of it. I just um, I would like to go on and invite some comments and discussion shortly. But um, there was an article in the Christadelphian uh, by Kevin Talbot from Cannock uh, this month's Christadelphian. Um, I expect you all know him, I, this part of the world. And I'm not criticising the article, but the first paragraph set me thinking and made me feel slightly uncomfortable, I have to admit, in certain respects. As saints, our view of risk is necessarily somewhat different from that of those of the world around us. We are not subject to time and chance in the same way that others are. 
We're the children of a loving Father who watches over every aspect of our lives and even knows the number of hairs on our head. Quoting Luke, verse 7, chapter 12, verse 7. And of course, he's right. But I'm not sure that we're not subject to fate, for want of a better word, and chance and time, just as others are. <clears throat> We were talking around the table of instances in our lives, one or two of us, where um, we appear to have been miraculously saved from dying. But this comes back in a way to where I started, because believing that without proper consideration can surely destroy our faith. If we think our life is going to be a bed of roses, and that nothing will go wrong, when something does go wrong, we are likely to lose our faith. And you may or may not know, but Jean and I lost a son when he was 34 years old to cancer. To some, that could be a faith-destroying incident. To others, it's an acceptance that we are subject to the laws of nature, that things can and will go wrong in our lives, and really, our faith has to be strong to face and live with that sort of instance and that situation. I can counter that by telling you that when I was 16 years old, I had a head-on collision with a car on a motorbike. I was on a motorbike. Went over the roof of the car, I was dressed like this. Rolled down the mud of that short trousers. I've got no protective gear on, no helmet, nothing. We didn't have them in those days. Gumball down the road, probably a combined uh, impact of about 40 miles an hour. Uh, Gumball down the road, lay in the road, thinking, oh, am I still alive? And in fact, there wasn't a mark on me. Now, some would say that was God protecting me. Some would say, you're jolly lucky. <laughs> I don't like the word lucky, incidentally. But nevertheless, there are many temptations, many things that can be inclined to destroy our faith in a godless world. And the question that was asked at the beginning was how strong is your faith in a godless world? You see, I believe that love or charity, depending how you want to define it, as in 1 Corinthians 13, is really the outpouring of faith and hope combined. That, in fact, it is because of our faith and because of the hope that we have and that we do believe and accept that God Almighty is in control of things, that his son Jesus taught us and showed us how to live, and he showed us how to live and summed it up with love God and love your neighbour as yourself.